Now, as you leaf through the glossy Sunday supplements today, will you gaze longingly at glamorous designs for new interiors or gardens and think that they could transform your lifestyle? Or, even more radically, will you glance at the ads on the back pages and consider plastic surgery for a new you? If so, you could be the victim of globalization. That's the startling claim made in a new book called The New Individualization which argues that the debate about globalization shouldn't just be seen in economic terms and the way it affects the third world. Apparently it has profound consequences for our emotional lives in the West. I spoke to one of the book's authors, Anthony Elliott, earlier, and I began by asking him to summarize exactly what his argument is. Our argument, uh, essentially, Steve, is that, as you say, the debate over globalization, which has raged over the last 10 years, has been um, intensive in, in the public sphere for the way in which big social change is altering the dynamics of our life. We know increasingly about how that's affecting uh, work, employment and so on, but we know much less about how this is imp impacting upon uh, personal identity, interpersonal relationships and so on. Mm. So that's what we wanted to do, Charles Lemmert and I in this book, The New Individualism, yeah. wanted to focus on uh, the emotional sphere and how that's being reshaped yeah. uh, by the forces of globalization. Yeah. And you refer to some fascinating individual examples, one of them being one of the great sort of newspaper obsessed themes of the moment, cosmetic surgery. And you go through a sort of some examples of this individual examples of uh, how in a way globalization has made it more possible and therefore more of an obsession with with some people um i suppose one of the questions to arise from this is you describe this as the costs of globalization mm. i mean isn't it a great thing that people if they want to can go over to africa or wherever to get it done more cheaply uh, otherwise they wouldn't have the chance Sure, and we're not denying, I think, that, that potential benefit to people. I mean, change, whether it's through plastic surgery, therapy, culture, instant identity makeovers that our culture is increasingly obsessed with, many of these changes allow people to undertake forms of change that would have been previously unimaginable, say, for our parents or our parents' parents. So we don't deny that uh, you know, extensive change is possible. What we're trying to draw attention to, however, are uh, the um, negative forces of, of change as well, particularly mm -hmm. given that much of the change that's promised, say by the makeover industry and by cosmetic surgery, is promised as instant change. And it often is instant, but it can have quite uh, lethal emotional consequences as well. Yeah, now this is the fascinating area. What do you think those lethal emotional consequences are? Well, in terms of many of the individuals that Charles Lemmert and I have been uh, interviewing over the last five years, uh, those that have, that have undertaken cosmetic surgery and um, uh, self-help and so on and so forth, uh, we've seen a range of, of responses uh, in terms of how these people's lives have turned out as a mm. consequence of the reinvention craze, varying all the way from loss of personal identity, uh, confusion, all the way through to depression, even sometimes suicidal tendencies. I mean, the cosmetic surgery one's a good one, we, in the sense that we, we begin the book with that, yeah. because it's a, very, uh, it's a very sad story about a young woman who, who undertakes this surgery, initially with the aim of wanting to be more, more beautiful, but after the fourth operation, in the interview, she admits that any idea of beauty has gone out the window and that what she's particularly now focused on is that she's got hooked. She's addicted to the process of, the, of reinventing herself. Yeah, yeah. But you see, some people would argue that actually this phenomenon is nothing to do with globalization at all. You know, you could argue, for example, it's to do with the media mm. intoxicating people mm. into wanting to change themselves. Mm. Endless programs about it, which I know what you mean, you could argue is sort of tangentially in itself a reflection of globalization. But why do you think it's a reflection of this globalization phenomenon rather than media fashion, uh, y yeah. you know, feeding people's natural vanity and all the rest of it. Well, I think the celebrity culture argument has been the big argument in recent years yeah. that because the rich and famous do it, and because it's getting cheaper, we've got a buoyant economy, uh, plastic surgery is cheaper to undertake, therefore others can do it. We think that, that, that it's not a bad argument, but it doesn't really capture what's going on because it, it's not just in this country and in the United States, it's Japan and New Zealand, Australia, Canada, you know, the expensive cities of the West, this is an increasing phenomenon. 
we think that the condition, the makeover culture condition, arises as a consequence of the impact of globalization, which is creating uh, new personal vulnerabilities as a consequence of three things, really. Um, you know, the uh, advances of technology, firstly. Uh, secondly, the desire to create change instantly. And thirdly, unstable work environments, which is associated with globalization. Yeah, yeah. So do you not think, if we weren't going through this phenomena, which is getting people worked up in so many different ways, some of these things would not happen? to do a sort of double negative, that there wouldn't be this focus on cosmetic surgery, there wouldn't be all this obsession of if we go and live in Spain or something, or, you know, the Caribbean, our lives will be transformed. Would none of this arise to the same extent? And if I, I not, what... wouldn't arise to the same extent. And, and Steve, the, the core of the argument is we, we posit, I mean, the book, the book's argument stands or falls on, on the key hypothesis that there's a link between what's happening economically today, yeah. the pressure, you know, the fact that multinationals can uh, and do switch their operations from city to city, country to country, at, you know, the push of a button. This puts immense pressure on people to change, and it gives rise to a fear of, I think, disposability about their jobs and their employment. Mm -hmm. It's that fear of disposability, it's that fear of not measuring up, I think, which is leading people to want to demonstrate to others, to family, to others at work, that they're kind of ahead of the game. Yeah. So that the reinvention craze is actually about saying to people, you know, look, I am a global player, I can undertake instant change, yeah. and, you know, I'm going to keep ahead of these economic, these large-scale economic forces. Yeah. I mean, it's clearly, potentially, if your assessment's right, very threatening and traumatic, all this uh, change. And what do you think the consequences are in terms of social uh, implications? Well, one of the things that we're not saying in the book, uh, you know, I've been very struck by the interviews that, we, that we've conducted. We're not saying that people are just having the wool pulled over their eyes. Uh, we're not saying that people are kind of cultural dopes. In fact, one of the interesting things about both surgery and, and therapy and self-help literature, um, the, and uh, it emerges from the stories we tell in the book, um, uh, you know, these are intelligent people that, that are doing their homework on who they want to go and see. Of course, globalization does make more information available that, as well. I mean, so that's right. People um, but know what they're doing. Nonetheless, there seems to be a disjunction between what's promised within the sphere of, say, the economy, that you know you can now you know have instant um, transformations of capital from San Francisco to Sydney at the push of a button or instant transformations in digital technology our argument is it doesn't work so well mm. with instant transformation of the emotions the emotions aren't skilled workers and to believe that you know just through uh, one you know makeover that that's going to change your emotional disposition to the world around you is is naive yeah. but I mean absolutely nothing could be done about this can it I mean that's part of the I suppose you would argue frightening thing. I mean, some people say this is all very positive but um, you know it is a phenomenon and uh, the British government tell France and Germany and others look you've got to become much more flexible to adapt to globalization mm. and on the whole although there's a debate in those countries about it they acknowledge one way or another they got to in other words, it's, it's a sort of unstoppable force which makes on one level your book a cry of despair but not one that much can be done about. It, it is, and from that angle, it, you know, our stories are stories about the kind of the, the runaway impact of globalization. Mm, yeah. But, I mean, it's not completely depressing news. I mean, towards, you know, we, we do tell stories about what we call surviving the new individualism and how people, you know, th that we've interviewed seem to somehow come out the other side. Part of that seems to involve... Um, getting a degree of distance from from what the makeover industry is telling us about the instantness of yeah. change if people can get a degree of distance from that um, you know that then there's a, a at least some promise of things being a, perhaps a little different yes when you say instant makeover um, is is that do you think the assumption people have that their lives will now be instantly changed through all of this or is that the promise that is never met by the people offering all this Sort of I mean, it, yes, it, it's certainly the promise. One of the stories we tell there of, of, of Larry in one of the chapters, a, a high 
tech exec in, in, in the US who immerses himself in the self-help literature. And if you look at that self-help literature in the, in the space of the last 10 or so years, we've gone, particularly in the States, from, from books with titles such as Change Your Life to then the, the next movement was Change Your Life in a year. Uh, we're down to Change Your Life increasingly now in a week. Um, you know, so I think the focus on the instantness is, uh, is especially significant. And it was one of the uh, factors that, that came up time and again from what our interviewees were telling us, that there, desire for instant change. Just finally and briefly, is there anything the government here, say, could do to address some of the worries you have arising from the book? Well, I, I certainly think that we need, um, in, from one angle, we, th we believe, Charles Lemmett and I believe that this book is, is partly a kind of a, a story about the, un, the untold, the unseen aspects of yeah. globalization. It's sort of globali the, the globalization to debate, as it were, that we yeah. now need to yeah. have. Yeah. Um, I would like to see a debate um, focused on the kind of emotional literacy of people in respect to these issues which uh, make over culture, therapy culture, speed dating, compulsive consumerism. These issues are often presented as being somewhat trivial. Sometimes people say, well, it's sort of harmless fun. I think our book shows that that's not the case, that, that there are bigger social issues here to be concerned with. Yeah. And I think the first thing we need to do in this country is have a serious political debate about it. Yeah, and, and, and educate people to be equipped and ready yes. more to address these consequences. Really interesting dimension on this whole globalisation debate, uh, Anthony Alex. Thank you very much indeed for coming and talking about it. Thank you.